So full disclosure, I have already broken my 2020 resolution and it hasn't even started yet. Um, not really, I don't even make them because I know me and I know that I'm, not gonna, I'm just not gonna do it. So I don't even make them anymore. Um, I heard someone over there, amen. Yes, right, why do we do it? Uh, we like to think that something's gonna change, right? And we have to be intentional about it with that. So I just don't even do it anymore. Also, final one that you will get from me today, um, our little flower that we bought, we already killed it and threw it away. So if you're one of those people with the green thumb, I commend you, but ours was dead the minute it walked into our house, it was already brown. So um, we have brown thumbs and we're not very good at that. But it was for a good cause for our kids to go to camp. So I'd encourage you guys, uh, if you didn't pick one up, to go ahead and pick one of those up for us. So if you remember, uh, I taught through Daniel 1 and Daniel 2. So now we're in Daniel 3. And so in in way of a quick recap, Daniel 1 through 6 is about how do we live in Babylon? How do we as Christians live in the world without being completely ruined by Babylon? the world, right? How do we live among pagans, right? And, and keep our Christian faith and not fall into that. And then all the way up to Daniel 7 through 12 is all about getting home from Babylon. So in Daniel 1, we saw that Daniel and about 70 to 80 people were taken into captivity, right? And everything that they knew and that they loved, they were brainwashed from that and taught something totally different, right? So everything they knew, was no longer what they knew, but they were allowed to know what the king taught them, except for what we're told to be about four guys. So these guys take a stand, and you guys, hopefully by now, you know the story. Daniel was faithful, and God gave them over into slavery. That's a big deal, because when hard times come, we know that God ultimately is behind it. Even when we can't see him, we can trust that he's there, and that he's working something better out for us than we could imagine. So then from there, we see that Daniel is faithful and God gives him and these other guys favor. So then as that's happening, this guy Nebuchadnezzar, who I call Nebi, uh, has these dreams and he's trying to find somebody to interpret it and God had blessed him, we're in Daniel 2 now, with the ability to interpret uh, these dreams and visions. So he tells Nebuchadnezzar, and this is gonna be important for what we're gonna look at today. He said, listen, this dream you had is about an image and the head of it is made of gold and you're that head. So now let's bring us to Daniel 3 is that all of a sudden Nebuchadnezzar, and we don't know the time frame. Some guys have speculated about 20 years past, but Nebuchadnezzar builds this thing, right? It's this nine foot wide by 90 foot tall golden like statue and some people say it probably was made of him and other people say well no, it was just like this big stick whatever it was there wasn't actually enough gold in Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom so it was probably gold plated with a, a very very large base than the nine foot on top of that so what happens is all of a sudden Nebuchadnezzar gets this idea so Daniel's sitting in his court and then Nebuchadnezzar at a different place comes up and says hey listen all of you musicians, you're gonna play a little ditty. And, and when you play this, everybody's gonna bow down to me because I'm a big deal, right? And you're gonna bow down and you're gonna face my statue and it's gonna be great. And I'm really excited about this opportunity and glad that y'all get to worship, right? And he's really jazzed up about this. So he brings in these people and everyone's there. All of the, the government officials, all of the big time people, not only were they there, but they were expected to be there, right? It's kind of one of those like, hey, we're gonna have a staff meeting. You're gonna be there, right? I'll be there, right? Right, you're gonna be there, right? So it's a big deal. Everybody was expected to be there at this big, it would have been like a religious kind of celebration as well, right? Let's go worship the new statue, it's a big deal. So all these people gather, and I'm giving you the cliff notes and we're gonna go back and look at it. So as they're gathered and they're worshiping this big thing, right? Some of these guys look out and they notice that there are these three guys who we read about in Daniel 1 and 2 who said, you know what? I'm just simply not gonna do that. I'm not gonna give in to this social pressure. I'm not gonna give in to this religious pressure. I'm not gonna give in to the peer pressure, but instead, we're gonna be different, right? So now cue Jeremiah 21, 9, 11, right? As for me and my family, right? So 
They say, but we're going to be different. We're not going to do what everybody else does just because everybody else is doing it. Now, how many of y'all have ever heard this? If all your friends jumped off the rainbow bridge, would you do it? <laughs> Probably would, right? I, I heard that all the time. I'm not going to say who, but my mom's right over there. Uh, would you do it? Yeah, that sounds like fun, right? Don't do it. And by the way, everywhere you go is something totally different. And it's hysterical, the different things that parents have come up with on that. So Nebuchadnezzar, he finds out that these guys didn't jump off the rainbow bridge when everybody else did and says, okay. So he walks up to him again and he's like, Dylan, Tyler, are you kidding me? You guys, listen, y'all, y'all probably misunderstood me. I'm going to give you one more chance to jump off the rainbow bridge and worship this thing with me. Are y'all for it? And they're like, man, we just can't do it. So Nebuchadnezzar gets really upset. He gets angry. And as he's angry, right, and all of this rage is building up, he says, I'm going to take you and I'm going to throw you in this fiery furnace. So imagine this thing has got a little window door on the side of it. And basically they bring him to the top and they're going to drop these guys in. But in his rage, Nebuchadnezzar has him bring it up to what a guy named Baldwell, he's a scholar, said was probably about 1800 degrees Fahrenheit. It's a little warm. And Nebuchadnezzar says, make it as hot as you can. We're going to throw these guys in. Interesting side note is that the guys who were supposed to throw him in, they died. We know that, right? But if you look at the language on this, it carries the connotation that these guys went in on their own after that because there would have been nobody to throw them in. So it says that these three fell into, right, so then from there, Nebuchadnezzar and his little peepholes checking things out, wanting to make sure that they knew that he was in charge, right? He's the boss. He's all over this. And he sees these three men, but now there's four, and they're walking around like this is no big deal. And by the way, this is a Christmas message. You'll see in a minute. Um, some of you are already laughing. I'm telling you, it's going to be a Christmas message, y'all. It's going to be good with trees and not and all of that, but you'll see. So they go in, and all of a sudden there's this fourth guy, and they say that this is like the image of the Son of God. It reminds me of, y'all ready? Emmanuel, God with us. Merry Christmas. So we see this idea of he's in the furnace with them, and then all of a sudden Nebuchadnezzar, who in chapter two and chapter one had made some big proclamation about who God is, only to view himself as a God, then goes all the way back and says, you know what? There is only one God like this. In fact, to show kind of how messed up Nebuchadnezzar was, he says... I'm going to make a decree that anyone who does not worship their God will be torn limb from limb and their house is laid in ruin. We ought to start doing that, y'all. Just saying, like, we can figure this out, right? So they're saying, for the glory of the Lord, we're going to rip you apart. So all of this is happening. Nebuchadnezzar then gives these guys these gifts, and then we never hear from them again. We don't know what happened after this. We know that they continue to serve. And so for us, again, it really carries this idea that we as Christians can live in this world, we can thrive in this world, and that we will be able to make a difference where we are at. So instead of a woe is me mentality, or as some have said, to be so heavenly focused we're no earthly good, we need to be willing to say, you know what, as I am put here, as God has put me on this earth at this time for this particular reason, I'm going to serve him with my family to the best of our ability in order, in order to honor and glorify him. And so that should really be our focus. So what we're going to see in Daniel 3 is God's people with some interaction in this world. So the first thing I want us to see is that God's people will be confronted with the idols of this world. So like I said, to start this off, Nebuchadnezzar sets up this big thing. It was a really big deal, right? Everybody came, they would have been looking at it. And I know we're already thinking, I, I, I just can't imagine somebody doing that. I can't imagine it. And yet on everything that we purchase, there's some kind of a maker's mark, right? If you have cattle, you brand them. You cut their ears, you do, I don't know what else you do to cattle, um, very farm raised, but you do something, right? You mark them as being yours. If uh, I do woodworking, I piddle, and I have been Googling and trying to find a brand because I want to put my mark on it because all of us desire to leave our mark on this world more than just a tombstone when we die. We want to leave that mark. So Nebuchadnezzar, his mark, because he said, you're going to be the head of gold, he erects this massive monument to himself. 
right, wrapped in gold that everybody can sit and be like, wow, look at that, right? We all want to leave our mark, and Nebuchadnezzar is no different. The thing is that it's how we leave our mark and what we leave our mark on and in speaks volumes to the life that we live. His was all about self-seeking. And I'd encourage you as we get ready to look at this, what kind of mark are you leaving? What kind of mark are we leaving on this world? Is the world better? Is the world know more about Christ and who he is because of the mark that we left? So again, Nebuchadnezzar was told this. He builds this big thing up and these guys won't bow. But I want us to think about this. Think about all of the pressure that these guys would have had to cave into this. Because what they could have done is made this big physical showing of their obedience to the king while inwardly living in active rebellion against the king. Well, people would never do that. But we come to church on Sunday and make these big proclamations of how good our king is and then come Monday, we're not there anymore, right? My goal for us is for 2020, for starting tomorrow, for this new year, however you want to put it, is that the very person we are on Sunday is that person who we are throughout the week and everywhere that we go, is that we're not putting on this show to try to appease someone, to try to please a king, but that we're serving the king of kings and putting him back on his throne where he belongs. So they could have given in. Think about this. Imagine if I go through all of this stuff and I've got this big celebration and when that music plays and Chasen hits whatever he hits and everybody starts bowing, we look out and see a few people that didn't. Imagine the pressure that those guys are on. Simply just, man, just cave, cave in, bro. Just do it. It's okay. People nudging them. Hey, just do this. It's fine. And they stood and they said, you know what? I don't have to do these things because I'm going to be different. I don't have to give in to this. We also see, again, that it was a time of a religious and national pride with this grand music. And what a special time to honor the king. And if you don't honor him, you're going to be killed. Do you guys realize, had they just simply caved into the pressure, everything they would have had. Had they simply just bowed, think of everything they would have had. They, they already were entrusted with the large portion of the kingdom. Think of everything they could have had, had they simply been compliant. And yet what we see is that, this is soapbox time, is that we are under more pressure than ever to be compliant to everything the news stations are telling us and that we should have fit this cookie cutter kind of life. And yet what we see is that these men said, I'm going to be different than everything else around me. I'm not gonna be the same. And so as we get ready to look at this upcoming year, we need to make sure that we're not just simply publicly bowing with the heart inside that's just dirty. Jesus put it this way and said that a lot of you guys, man, we're just nothing more to the Pharisees. You're nothing more than whitewashed tombs. Man, you look great, but you're dirty. And my prayer as I try to lead my family the best I know how is that I lead in a way that honors the Lord in the process. And my hope for you is that you don't allow these idols of this world as you're confronted with it to take over your life. You see, because not bowing would absolutely humiliate the king and they were willing to do that in order to honor what they knew was right uh there's a song that i heard years ago called the general has anybody heard that i'm kind of looking at different age groups or where you're at to know who would recognize it um okay i get to tell you about a cool song this song is all about this general that gets up and he makes this massive speech to all of his men and they're all around him. He says, guys, listen, it's gonna get tough. It's gonna be hard. I don't know if we're gonna make it, but I'm, I'm gonna count on you. But if you want, you can go. And the song says one by one, all of his men were like, cool. Right, kind of like slowly creeping away from him. Imagine Nebuchadnezzar makes this big last second appeal to them. As you see, it says, guys, listen, all you have to do is do this and it's gonna be okay. And he was expecting them to simply cave into this pressure. One by one, like this general, expecting some big change, and they never quite did it. They said, we're not going to do this. We're not going to do this. We don't need to do this. Crickets all around. They had no desire to cave into this pressure. You see, the reality for these men is that while they were still guests, they were former captives. And you would expect, if nothing else, these men to simply bow down for the sake of giving in to everything around them they chose not to. You see, guys, the reality is that some idols will come quickly into our lives and quickly consume and erode our hearts, while others are there all along and they slowly gain a foothold. 
Not all idols come up to us in the shape of a totem pole that we think we have to bow down to, right? Sometimes these idols don't come in the way of a 90-foot spear or whatever it was, but it slowly creeps into this thing that says, you know what? I'm tired of being lonely, so I'm going to be in this relationship. And while she's not a believer, he's not a believer, it's okay. They got good morals, so it kind of creeps in that way. Or I I really want my kid to be able to do this. You know I was going to hit sports at some point, y'all. I'm just saying. I really want my kid to be able to excel, so we're going to do this. I really, you know, if I just work a little bit harder, I can get that next promotion. If I keep doing this, I can slowly become an Instagram model. Uh, all, not me. All of these things, right, that we strive for. If I just work more, I can get just a little bit more money. And we keep wanting a little more. Sometimes idols don't necessarily look at that big pole, but it's these things that slowly erode our hearts and slowly draw us away from who God has called us to be. And so my my challenge for us as we're confronted with all of these idols that the world has to offer is that we evaluate our hearts, look at what's going on and say, you know what, moving forward, we're not gonna do this as a family, but we're gonna put God first because that's what he desires and what he's worthy of. You see guys, the reality is that while we are exiles in a foreign land and idols can be seductive and look appealing, we need to choose right now on purpose that we're not gonna be giving into those because they're just not worth the cost. Second point is this. God's people will be criticized by the people of this world. Understand is that if you allow yourself to be different, then you will be criticized for that. And here's how I know that. Look at verse eight. I'm gonna read eight, nine, and 12. God's word says this. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. They declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Verse 12. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the providence. These men, O king, did not listen to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. So check out what's happening. These Chaldeans, these men come up and they immediately blame the Jews, right? They blame these guys. Hey man, listen, they didn't do that. O king, live forever. They're just favoring the king. They're they're trying to get his attention. They're trying to say, you know what? They're trying to butter him up a little bit. We're going to blame the Jews. These guys are horrible. King, live forever because you're good, not like them. Oh, by the way, didn't you put them in charge? Can you imagine the audacity of these guys? Kind of like it. Kind of froggy, right? They go up to the king and said, listen, king, this is your fault. You got to fix this. These are your boys. You got to make this right. You see, guys, we can expect that we will be criticized by the people of this world. The enemy knows how to make even the most simple idol seem superior to all other things. The most simple idol can look like something we just absolutely have to have above all else. When I was younger, I was obsessed with a certain video game. And when I finally beat it, I was like, whew, and that's it. And then I was like, wait, that's it? I spent this time, that, that's it? So many times, Tom Brady said it best, after winning his first Super Bowl, he woke up the next day and said, man, I just thought there'd be more. Thought there'd be more. So many times, these idols that we pursue, all this criticism that we take on, we're gonna find that it leads us nowhere. We almost feel bad for cheating on our idols. You guys realize that? Sometimes we're like, man, I just, I just gotta do more, and I couldn't get to it this week, but we're gonna miss out on, right? There's all of this desire to do these things. And I believe wholeheartedly that the world has a way of saying you're gonna, the the fear of missing out, right, FOMO? That if you can't do this, then your life is gonna be incomplete. That's why if I buy certain clothes and can look a certain way, I fit in with certain types of people, right? All this stuff, all the lies that we're fed on a daily basis, we can expect to be criticized. If you look at verse eight, it says that these Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused This word carries the idea of being ate the pieces of. It's a severe hatred and bitter language. It chewed them out. Might be kind of like an English phrase, but just not quite as hard. So then we see that they're blaming them. They go to the king and they suck up to him. You see, guys, the reality and what we find is had they just gone along with it, they could have kept worshiping their God and all would have been okay. They could have kept doing it and everything would be okay. And yet, sometimes what we find is being a Christian really isn't popular. It's popular until you're like a real Christian. 
right? It's popular until it starts interfering with our lives. And I know y'all find this hard to believe, but I have parents come up to me and say, man, I love that my kid's different. I just wish it wouldn't take this Jesus thing so serious. You want your kid to be good, right? Send them to a counselor, like, but don't let them be godly. Don't ever let your kids surrender to ministry. What a tragedy that would be all the time. We want our kid to be good, not to cheat in school, but we don't want him to really be like that kind of Christian. We don't want him to be like an Aaron Christian. Oh, could you imagine? He's taking that Jesus thing a little bit too far. Okay. Parents, it's up to us to decide and how we're gonna lead. Something interesting, and I gotta move past that because I get a little worked up dealing with you parents all the time. Uh, notice that their civil disobedience, by the way, wasn't a spectacle. It was just simply quiet and simple. Guys, we don't always have to shout our stance. People will see it. People will see our position and see our stance. And it's important that we talk about it, but we have to be willing to be quiet about it. So the Chaldeans, again, they present their case. We've got to move on. They blame him, and now he has to save face, right? You appointed him, king. These are your guys. They ignored you. They don't serve your God, and they don't worship the statues that you set up. Three times they come against these guys on these three separate ways. Again, these attacks are made personal, and I love what they failed to do. They ignored the king's request, they didn't serve his gods, and they refused to worship his statues. What's interesting is if you go all the way back to chapter one, these men were given a position of authority, he was given favor, and now he wants them dead in, in uh, chapter three, or verse 13. Look at verse 13, we're gonna move on past this. God's people will be challenged to worship the gods of this world. 13 through 15, God's word says this, Right, so they refused to bow down. And then it says, Then Nebuchadnezzar in a furious rage commanded to be brought away. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Guys, listen, is this really true? That you will not serve my gods or worship the golden image? Now, if you're ready, you get one more shot. If you can do this, when we have all this musician play, everything will be well and good. But if not, you will immediately be cast into the burning, fiery furnace. And who is your God that he can deliver you out of my hand? It's a bold proclamation. So Nebuchadnezzar, or so they answered and said, oh, ne I love this. They don't even call him king. They're like, listen, Nebi, we're not gonna do that. You're out of your mind. We won't need to answer you this. You know our stance. You see, guys, we go from this connotation of extreme anger and rage, of being fury and rage, but these three Jews resisted the herd mentality and stood alone. Don't miss this. A lot of us have this idea that if I take this Jesus thing serious, I'm gonna miss out on something. We're gonna miss out. But we'll miss out on this and my kid won't be able to do this and that, that's our bingo night. And we're only gonna miss church on Wednesdays. It's not that big of a deal. Parents, do you guys remember, and I was gonna pull him up, but I don't wanna embarrass him. Y'all remember them pants with the little uh, hammer belt loop on the side? Y'all know what I'm talking about? That little hammer loop? And then you got the carpenter pants on the other side. You put like your knife in and what, I don't know what all you put in it. Your stuff, frogs maybe, I don't know. But y'all know what I'm talking about? When I was little, my grandfather Lincoln had a pair. And we were going somewhere and like a good little boy, I was not paying, we were going to Western Auto. I was not paying a bit of attention to him. And he grabbed my hand and he put it on that little hammer loop and said, you need to hold on to this. And everywhere that he went, boy, I was being forced. Now you put your kids on them dog leashes, I'm just saying. Um, so I'm holding on his little loop, and everywhere that he went is where I went. Everywhere that he went. And if I let go, grab my little hand, put it back on, and here we go. You see, parents, you have the ability to lead your children. The reality is that many aren't willing to re-grab our kids' hands and put them back where they need to go. And I'm gonna say that again for you in the back. Many of us parents refuse to re-grab our kids' hands and to lead them right on the path that they need to go. Well, they don't wanna do it. Let your kid touch the stove. They wanna do that. You see the reality, and I say this all the time, I can't fix in an hour what you allow your kids to do in the other 167 hours of the week. Just can't do it. But, if we would take our children, grab their little hands, put them up on our little belt loop, our little hammer pace, place, and let them walk around with us, as Deuteronomy 6 says, 
You won't need me and I'll be out of a job. Some of you are like, that's how we get rid of you. Guys, parents, men, women, grandparents, it's up to us to lead and we have to lead. Whenever we're challenged to cave into our relationship with God for all these other things, it fails in comparison to how we should be leading our family because we'll lead them everywhere but to church. Man, it's Sunday and I'm here, I get that and I'm so thankful. We need to make sure that we're willing to lead our families. And this, this starts with me too. I, I'm just as guilty. You see the adults. Nope. We're gonna move past that. All right, verse 15. They're given another opportunity to bow. And what they do is remarkable. They said, listen, are you really gonna do this? If you don't do this, you won't fit in. We're gonna kill you. All this is, and they said, listen, no amount of what you have to offer me world, no amount of that is worth me losing my relationship with God over. No amount of anything else is worth it. No amount of your kid getting a $500 soccer scholarship is worth losing your kids to everything this world has to offer. It's just not. And guys, I know that I say this all the time and I seem upset about it all the time. It's because my heart breaks looking through and seeing kids that just disappear off the face of the earth. And I'm convinced it starts with parenting. I, I really am. Let's move on. So, there's gotta be a good point, we're gonna get there. God's people must be courageous in the face of danger in this world. Verse 16, again, we see that they don't even call him by king, they call him by name. You see, God's desire to get the gospel to every nation, tribe, and tongue doesn't mean that all the nations are gonna be very receptive to it. Some are gonna be hostile and bitter and angry. And that's exactly what we find in the situation is that they're not all welcome. And yet we still have to be willing to go. In the midst of slavery, these three men said, I don't care what everybody else is doing, we're gonna be different. And y'all, we have to be different as a church. We have to offer what the world cannot offer, and that is a hope of the king who died for us that we can know who he is and bring him honor and glory. We have that hope that nothing else can give. You see, their rise from slavery to royalty was short-lived, and often our favor with the world is rare and short-lived as far as that goes. You see, the reality is that regardless of the outcome, these three things are clear. God's servants only bow to the king, only bow to God. Their servants trust his sovereign plan no matter what, and God's servants trust his power and protection alone. Here's how I know that. Look at verse 17. If this be so, our God, who is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. See guys, these guys were willing to talk to the king in a very uncomfortable manner to say, you know what, I don't care what you say, king, what you're asking us to do is not right, therefore we're not gonna do it. And that is a position and the face that we must take when we're confronted with all the things this world has to offer. You see, Jesus says it best in Mark 13. Just read this to you, this is good. However many years later this would have been, right? Some 600 years. If I can turn there. Mark's in the New Testament. Mark 9, 1, or 13, 9 says this. But be on guard, for they will deliver you over to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them, and the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. Jesus says, listen, guys, you're gonna face this. It's gonna be hard. It's gonna be difficult. But the stance that we take is vital to do that. You see, they believed that God could deliver them, but they were not presumptuous that he would. They just believed that he could. Uh, final point is this, guys. God's people can be confident that the Lord is with them in this world. God's people can be confident that the Lord is with them in this world. Look at verses 19 through 30. I'm gonna read just a few of them. Verse 19, God's word says this. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury and the expression of his face was changed against them. And he ordered the furnace to be heated uh, seven times more than it usually was heated. Verse 23, and these, three, and these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the fiery furnace. Verse 25, and he answered and said, I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire and they are not hurt and the appearance is like a son of the gods. Verse 27, and all the people gathered together and saw that the fire had no power over the bodies of these men. The hair of their heads was not singed, their cloaks were not harmed and the smell of fire had not come upon them. 
that Nebuchadnezzar blesses God, and that's when he makes that comment about ripping people apart. It's just a little messed up on his theology. See, guys, if you go back to verse 25, and you notice their faithfulness to stand up in the midst of what everybody else is doing, we need to understand that turbulence is needed to get to where we're going. If you've ever flown and you hit that turbulence, they just power, they just power through it. Try to go around and just keep going. Guys, turbulence is needed to get to where we're going. Our life's not gonna be daisies and daffodils all day. Sometimes it's gonna be hard. And yet those hard times mold and make us into who God desires for us to be. And so with this, we see that their turbulence was a big deal. But I want you to check this out. And it just dawned on me when I was studying this. You notice God didn't deliver them out of the fire. Y'all notice that? What'd God do? He met them right there. God met them right in the midst of the fire. Y'all don't know what you're going through today. I don't know what you've been dealing with the past week, month, years of your life. But understand that God's not necessarily gonna bring you out of the fire, but he desires to meet you there. And he'll be alongside of you throughout this process, throughout all of it. You see, God gives us sometimes the very things that we fear in order to save us. It carries this idea of losing your own life in order to gain his, right? We see that all throughout the New Testament, Luke 9, 23 specifically. God says, sometimes the very thing that you fear the most, death, I'm gonna put you right next to it and you're gonna come out smelling like roses. He did that with Abraham and Isaac when he was told to offer up his son. Sometimes God desires for us to go through the hardships in order that we can learn to lean on him more because oftentimes we learn more from the valley than we ever do the mountaintops in our faith. We learn far more on how to trust him than that. You see, a strong faith is built in the fire, again, not in the mountaintops. The king caused them to prosper. I love that. As you see in verse uh, 29 and 30, the king blesses them in great ways. Material possessions, all these accolades, all this stuff. And what we see is that even with them, no matter the heartache that we go through, God will see us through it. And the crucible of judgment, God will see his people through. And then I love verse 30, and we'll end on this. And the king promoted them in the providence of Babylon. He takes these slaves, elevates them up, throws them into a furnace to kill them, brings them back out, promises now to put them in these positions of authority over everything that they had. You see, guys, God was able to bless them in the midst of where they were despite the circumstances. And what I want you to know is that God's blessings look different for all of us depending on what he's doing, but ultimately we know that his blessings are far greater than anything that we have. So in the midst of all of this, these guys are impacting a pagan culture. And like I said earlier, being a Christmas message, the one with them, Emmanuel, God with us. So as we get ready to wrap this up, I wanna ask you this. For 2020, what idols are we looking at in our lives? What things are there that we know we need to remove in order to protect our life? Because what I can promise you is that you will be criticized by the people of this world, will be challenged to cave into our belief system, but we have to be courageous in the face of danger to all that's going around us. Why? Because we know that God's people are confident that God is with us in this world and everything else going around with them. You see, guys, you and your family can impact this pagan world. This year, as we get ready to look to 2020, and as you're getting ready to make and break your resolutions and all of those things, I want to encourage you to look at the very idols in, in my life, in your life, in all of those areas in our hearts that we don't even really wanna talk about publicly. Let's look at those and figure out how we can defeat them and how we can honestly serve God more than what we're already doing. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. God, I'm thankful for your word. I'm thankful that uh, in the midst of a furnace, you just showed up. And God, you're able to save, to meet us in the midst of our pain and hurt and heartache. And Lord, I know there's some people going through that right now. Lord, they're going through pain and heartache and struggles and the holidays aren't very holly for them. Lord, it's not very jolly, happy time. It's painful. And Lord, I pray that they would trust you. God, to those in this room who do not know you, God, I pray that just like these men knew you and set their face before you, God, that they would give their lives over to you. Lord, that they would say, God, I, I don't know that much. I just know that I need you. So Lord, I pray for life change. God, I pray that um, our families will desire to serve you over all else. Lord, we love you. We're so thankful for your grace. And God, again, to, to the one in the room that doesn't know you, I pray that today could be that day. Lord, we're so thankful for your grace. In your name we pray, amen.